Hello, um, I'm very excited to introduce this morning Professor Neil Miller. Um, I came across Dr Miller's um, work in a 2022 paper in Nature Reviews on Frozen Shoulder, which was extremely informative and impressed me a lot. Um, Professor Miller, would you like to um, uh, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your work? Thanks. Thanks for having me, first off. Um, so my name is Neil Miller. I'm a, a, an orthopaedic surgeon scientist based in Glasgow in uh, Scotland. Um, I'm mostly a shoulder surgeon, although I do some uh, other work on, on uh, tendons. And then we run a basic science laboratory here in Glasgow looking at a lot of soft tissue diseases. So we look at tendinopathy. But uh, more recently in the past sort of five years, I've been looking at frozen shoulder and understanding immune mechanisms. So somehow uh, inflammation and immunology play a role. We also look at trials and, and clinical treatments as well. So that's sort of how um, we have become interested in, in, in frozen shoulder as sort of um, uh, immune based disease over the past few years. It's uh, very good to hear that um, immune um, system uh, work being brought into the picture. That's that's really good. Um, so can you describe the symptoms of um, shoulder arthrofibrosis, as I like to call it? I mean, the I mean, a patient will come really in pain. That's the biggest. Uh, they'll come saying that they've got significant pain at night. Um, They've got pain during the day and there's nothing they can do about it. And then the other symptom that's associated, obviously, is stiffness. But the stiffness can be a gradual sort of onset. It's not definitive. In fact, um, you know, some people come with not that much stiffness, but notice pain and then the gradually loss of what we call external rotation. So we're, we're like this, we can't externally rotate the arm. But most patients present predominantly 90% of the time with just complete pain within the shoulder that is not controlled with analgesia, uh, tablets, etc. So that's uh, pain and a little bit of stiffness, but not always the two, not always the two together. OK, that's really interesting, actually. So given that it's not a straightforward picture, how do you go about diagnosing whether it's caused by that or something else? <laughs> Yeah, this so it, it it it's a bit of a it can be debated certainly in the shoulder world. I think you have to be you know it's like everything in medicine, a, a good history and listening to the patient. The patient will be right ninety nine percent of the time. So if you actually just listen to them and understand the sequelae of how uh, the pain started and whether they've noticed any stiffness, you need to rule out other things. Of course, you need to rule out. A glenohumeral joint instability, you need to rule out uh, uh, subacromial pain, so just rotator cuff uh, pathology, as well as the acromiomyoclavicular joint. And how you do that, one of the first things we do is take a history, obviously examine the shoulder. One of the first things you'll lose with a frozen shoulder range of movement, as I said, is the loss of external rotation. It will be even subtle, so we can normally, most people can rot externally rotate to about 90 degrees. And it will be subtle, it'll start to, you know, the person will maybe only be able to externally rotate to 40, 50 or 60. And really when you've got loss of external rotation, it's one of two diagnoses normally, and that's uh, differentiating frozen shoulder from glenohumeral joint osteoarthritis. And the safest way to do that is get some plain x-rays. And that's a very important, you know, this has been debated in the shoulder uh, literature for the last few years, but ultimately, a plain shoulder x-ray will help you differentiate between osteoarthritis and frozen shoulder, which is the main two diagnoses, having ruled out anything else, uh, because you'll see joint um, degenerative changes. So it's really important to do that. So I would say the best way to diagnose it is listen to your patient in the history, uh, a plain x-ray of the shoulder and its loss of external rotation really will be be your guide. Um, and a, what, what I tend to call a very painful and irritable shoulder. In, in, in other words, any movement you really do with the patient, they don't really like it. So that stiffness can come on further down the track. It's not always there right at the start. Yeah, I mean, it'll be quite subtle at the start, depending on what stage the patient presents, but they'll predominantly be painful. And then they'll they'll still be able to externally rotate maybe to 50, 60 degrees, but not if you compare it to the other side, of course, which is uh, useful for shoulders is that you know you'll have a loss and then that loss becomes even you know and some patients can't externally rotate at all have zero or 10 degrees of external rotation and that's when they're more in the sort of stiffness phase where that's really where the pain has reached its peak and is dying down and then they're just stiff they can't move the shoulder 
So what percentage of the population would get frozen shoulder, do you think? Um, so it's about a lifetime lifetime prevalence of about up to 5% in the general population. Um, it affects about 8%, 8% percent of men, a little bit more, about 10 percent of females, uh, most common in the sort of 50s and 60s and the peak age is around the mid 50s um, and then about up to maybe 15 to 20 percent of patients, uh, the other shoulder will become affected within a sort of five year time frame. So actually it's a pretty, um, although I'm a little bit biased obviously as a shoulder surgeon and see a lot of patients, it is actually quite a prevalent disease more prevalent than what you you might consider um it's not unique as you know to the shoulder it can affect you know adhesive capsulitis can affect the knee hip and ankle and but the most common if you look at the literature it affects the the shoulder and there's you know the reason for that is that there is some science to suggest it's you know a capsular driven disease and the you know the capsule is quite a predominant feature in the shoulder it move it, the shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body and therefore any sort of changes in the capsule you will notice as a patient more than maybe say in your hip or your your ankle so it's more it's it's sort of thought to be down to that as well the fact that it is the most mobile joint oh, that's interesting yeah so I like to call it shoulder arthrofibrosis just so we have one name across all the joints that people understand. Mm. But there are other names. Um, are there any differences between, you know, what we're talking about here and the stages or? No, not really. I mean, I think um, that I tend to use frozen shoulder because it's better, for, it's easier for patients. They sort of understand it and get it. Adhesive capsulitis was popularised in the 80s and 90s can be a little bit confusing although we sometimes tend to use that in some of the publications and then ar yeah arthrofibro you know, arthrofibrosis is really the that stiffening or um fibrotic disease of any joint just so you can differentiate between um but there's no there's no difference in the path no sort of or immune based theories or studies into that it's pretty much across if you look at, you know, if you biopsy an ankle arthrofibrosis or a knee arthrofibrosis and compare it to a frozen shoulder, it's very, very, very similar um, diseases happening in, in, the, in the separate joints. So can you tell us a little bit about the causes of it in the shoulder? We, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose that, yeah, there's, there's certain risk factors which are important. So um, the most important is to ask your patient to, are they diabetic uh, or, and have they any thyroid problems because those two are strongly linked with an increased incidence of of frozen shoulder particularly diabetes because those patients can be more difficult to manage because they actually are more likely to have recurrent frozen shoulder in other words right. even if you solve the problem so it's important to highlight that to them um, at the start um really early on when you're you're speaking to them um uh, other ones which are becoming more important, it's really any metabolic disturbance, so hyperlipidemia, even hypoadrenalism. So it's important to check um, for, uh, you know, uh, systemic metabolic issues. Um, there's some other risk factors, cardio, uh, sort of cardiopulmonary disease, um, cerebrovascular disease, having a stroke, etc., cetera, a humeral fracture. Um, you know, and, and there's also intrinsic factors in the shoulder which can you know, cause a frozen shoulder. So you can have a cuff tendinopathy or a rotator cuff tear that drives an inflammatory response in the capsule that then means you get a secondary, you know, frozen shoulder, even, even AC joint arthritis, calcific tendinopathy. So it's being able to uh, understand those processes and the risk factors, um, which can be can be quite important in, in sort of helping you um helping the patient understand maybe why this has happened etc mm -hmm. so those are the sort of risk factors i mean the mechanisms you know most most now point towards you know disruption between the homeost but really the homeostasis of of the the joint and the capsule is disrupted um mainly from inflammation neoangiogenesis so neoangiogenesis is new blood vessel in growth and then some of the pain is thought to come from you know neo innervation or new nerves growing into the into the inflammatory mix and i think all, all those three processes probably work in tandem in the fibrotic processes or the fibrotic mechanisms and um, that inflammation neoangiogenesis and neo innervation drive this painful restricted 
range of move or restricted problem and um, that then eventually with certain treatments um, you know can improve and um, inflammation has certainly come to the fore as uh, although I'm slightly biased but as one of the main drivers of the disease actually because if you take a biopsy if, if I took a biopsy and showed you a slide of a rheumatoid arthritis joint so a synovium from a rheumatoid arthritis and I then put beside it a frozen shoulder and I blinded you you would have basically no you would there'd be very little difference or you would be hard pushed to pull the difference apart showing that remember rheumatoid is a systemic inflammatory immune disease so there is a lot of influx of immune cells important immune cells such as T cells dendritic cells these things drive chronicity they drive they talk to the resident cells sort of fibroblasts within the shoulder capsule and they really drive this persistent inflammatory response um, and they have become more important and they release small peptides called cytokines which again just again cause um, further inflammation and further damage to the the capsule and uh, etc and with those then come these uh, new blood vessels and new nerves and the nerves really are linked can be linked to a lot of the increased pain that patients uh, see and then finally of course with all that you get the matrix changes so it's you know all those cytokines immune cells and things disrupt the resident important cell called the fibroblast and it, it really affects the structure and that's why you get stiffness that's ultimately as a patient why you can't move your shoulder or you get it's irritable to move because that that tissue your, your shoulder caps is normally a few millimeters thick it becomes thickened to you know up you know up to a centimeter wow. in some wow. cases and that means you can imagine the process that's involved with that in in, in matrix so that's that's a, a brief description of sort of the molecular mechanisms it's a lot more um nuanced you know it's a lot more uh, detailed than that and we are certainly a lot of groups around the world are trying to dissect and understand those mechanisms because I think ultimately the more you understand about that the more likely you are to develop new treatments that you may be able to interrupt those early processes for the patient or, or get those processes affected earlier and therefore if you do that and um, maybe stop the process that's the sort of ultimate aim so I think understanding all those what we call the molecular changes or molecular pathophysiology is actually pretty important that's fantastic information thank you yeah um do you think that nerves play a major role in the pathology i think that nerves are not i, I don't think that it is an a, a nerve driven disease in other words i don't think that the the new innervation or the new nerves come from the inflammatory process and we know this in all diseases that when you have inflammation you get associated sort of what we call um, neuroinflammation in other words the nervous system is irritated and starts and produces a range of factors so I think what happens there is the immune system is dysregulated and with that dysregulation comes um, new nerve ingrowth and with that then nerve what sort of nerve mediators like um, uh, substance P which causes pain um all these mediators histamine etc that and then they drive that uh, uh, i think pain from that so i think yeah nerves are very important but i don't think they're they're the fundamental cause of the disease i think they're as a result of the inflammatory process that's going on part of the whole picture and yeah. what about yeah what about fat pads which are often full of nerves and immune cells and um, yeah, there's been some. Yeah, there's been some evidence, or well, there's been some studies done in that. Um, not so much in the shoulder. Obviously, it doesn't really have a real role to play there. But in sort of the, the ankle and the knee, there has been work done to show that the fat pads are a reservoir for um, not only sort of stem cells as such, or well, presumably stem cells, but inflammatory mediators. In other words, they can become, um, they can contribute to that. I don't think that it, it's a, a large component look um but i think it is they can contribute certainly mm, very interesting yeah they, they seem to play quite a big role in knee arthrofibrosis with the, yeah. particularly with the pinching of the ifp and mm -hmm. yeah um so what percentage of people do you think would make a, a recovery either full or partial yeah i think this is i mean this is a bit of a, a debatable one as well i think the literature would say that 
you know, most people, are, well, it depends what you read, but say, oh, you know, it's a self-limiting disease that, you know, people get better from. But actually, mm-hmm. when you delve deep into it, I, I think about 40% of the patients never really make a full recovery. In other words, they may get, you know, they may improve the range of movement going from here to here, but a, a lot of them do not get full functionality back in their shoulder, which is quite a, you know, that is a large percentage. So this old adage that, look, you'll get a frozen shoulder, you'll ride it out and, you know, within two years, you'll be fine. When you delve deep into the literature, you find that people haven't returned to work. They haven't got their full range of movement back. They've got persistent pain. They've got a bit of associated depression. They've had, you know, so actually it's it's a much bigger problem than what is recognised. So I think about the recent literature sort of says about 40 percent don't get back to normal. Yeah, right. And you mentioned earlier that people can have a recurrence. So are there things that they can do to minimise that risk? Uh, no, well, yes, because if you've got better diabetic control, if you've got better thyroid control, if you've got better control of your any metabolic associated risk factors, yes, you can reduce your risk. Um, but the general population where there's no underlying associated risk factors, that's a difficult one because you can't really modify uh, your your risk to that. Um, and again, you know, you could fall over and have a proximal humerus fracture and then get frozen. So there's lots of um, factors that you cannot control. But certainly the ones that you can control are if you've got any metabolic underlying disease. If you could get that under control, if you're better controlled in that respect, your risk of getting frozen shoulder does reduce. Yes. Very good. That's helpful. So um, I know that physiotherapy is one of the mainstays of treatment. Um, are there any types of physiotherapy that could potentially make it worse? Um, in my opinion, no. Yeah, this again, there's lots. The physiotherapy world is full of different small studies in this about, you know, what type of physiotherapy works. Are there any other modalities, cold, heat, nerve stimulation, you know, uh, electromagnetic field therapy? I think that any just trying to stretch and strengthen the shoulder over a period of time in conjunction with understanding the patient's pain level will it will it will improve that patient and um, so that means there's no i think the physiotherapy world would would agree that there's lots of different research there's lots of different intensity of stretching the patient's irritability level it, it's more that it, it's the importance is the right treatment intensities for that patient so it's understanding their pain limits, um, passive sort of stretching. And um, it has been shown that actually spending time with a physical therapist or physiotherapist is better than just doing home exercises where you're doing it yourself. So I, I'm not really prescript. I don't think there should be a prescriptive approach to the, the physiotherapy should really be patient orientated. So if your patient, you know, it's got very high pain levels, you're not going to do very much with them those weeks get their pain under control you can use a corticosteroid injection with physio which is probably the best evidence at the moment because it dampens the immune uh, response within the shoulder and then so so i wouldn't be say oh we have to do passive stretch stretch you know i i would say look any help in moving the shoulder stretching then strengthening is really where you want to go whilst getting their pain under control okay thank you and obviously surgery is an option in some circumstances. Are there circumstances where you wouldn't do it or? Um... Um, I tend to, so I, I've i moved away from using surgery as much, I think, because um, I, I use it as a sort of last resort. Um, so what we, t- or my practice would certainly be, would be physiotherapy and a, cort- a corticosteroid injection into the joint if depending on, on, on how they're doing. So if they'd had physio and are not responding, I'd add in a corticosteroid injection and then continue physio and making sure they've got good uh, analgesia as well as that. So they're taking paracetamol, ibuprofen, et cetera, the, the general sort of things. Then I usually move on to hydrodilatation or uh, where, in other words, where a large volume of water is injected to sort of burst the capsule. I like that because Although it's not 100% effective, it's probably only 60 to 70% effective overall. It's less aggressive for the patient. It's a 30-minute procedure under local anaesthetic, and they can see a very rapid response if they mm. are going to uh, going. It's going to work. 
um, and it's safer than surgery overall, really. Um, and I like to use it in my diabetic population because starting to operate on diabetics has a range of other risk factors that come with it, um, infection, wound problems, etc. So I tend to use hydrodilatation as my next port of call. And then my last resort would be um, an arthroscopic or keyhole capsule release. Um, there, there are other methods. You can do an old fashioned, what we call manipulation under anaesthetic, and that does work. It's cheap, cheaper than arthroscopic surgery. And there's a trial being done in the UK about that, a randomized control trial showing whether you get physiotherapy, a manipulation under anaesthesia, or an arthroscopic capsule release, et cetera. Um, everybody pretty much gets better. Um, which is encouraging. However, there are, certainly the arthroscopic people got better quicker and they certainly had less um, recurrence. Uh, however, it is, it is much more expensive and it is higher risk of complications when you compare it to physiotherapy or even a manipulation under anaesthesia. So, yeah, uh, surgery for me is a last resort, but it does work very well in the majority of patients. Um, the patients that you need to be more cautious in is again those patients with metabolic disturbance because they are much more likely to have recurrence and they're much more likely to have surgical complications so you need to explain that to the patient and would that include possibly making the condition worse rather than better yes some, i mean sometimes yeah i think that's that is rare but yes surgeries can certainly make things worse than that they can get a pain response from that they can become more stiff it's um it's not the norm Let's put it like that. But you would have to counsel the patient. Yeah, we don't always make it. We can't always make everything better. And there is a small risk of making it worse. But I would say that risk is very, very, you know, a couple of percentage points. OK, very good. Yeah. Um, so I have some questions from uh, people with uh, frozen shoulder. Um, yeah. Can the administration of relaxin 2 help in a treatment of frozen shoulder? And is it available? <laughs> it's not available. Um, it's theoretically um possible and um, because there's been some work done on that there's a lot i mean there's lots of potential therapies that we are sort of looking at and working on um, and i think that's why it's really important that we continue to focus on the basic science of this disease and really understand mm. what is causing it because by what causing it yeah we may get to a point of using relaxin to your calcitonin which we uh calcitonin spray is used in some circumstances um, so, I mean, I, I, it's not available, but it may, something like that is probably going to come along in the ne next sort of five to 10 years that will uh, ultimately treat the earlier phase of the disease. That would be fabulous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, is there a difference in uh, range of motion with a frozen shoulder compared to a rotator cuff tear? How do you know which is causing it? I think the the clinically the main difference there is to really do with the history and the um, the pain. So a rotator cuff tear is very sore at the start. Uh, you know, uh, very can be very painful, similar to frozen shoulder. The pain normally goes away. The pain can go away reasonably quickly. And um, with frozen shoulder, the pain does not go away. Ask any patient. So a rotator cuff, yes, and you can get fooled in in examination. And, you know, you've lost your cuff. And you can't move as well. However, mostly you you tend to still get external rotation because um, infras, infraspinatus is the tendon that does that, and it doesn't allow it tears. It doesn't tear fully off, and so they normally have some uh, um, external rotation. But yes, you can if you're a good clinician and see these shoulders regularly, they're pretty easy to differentiate between a cuff tear and uh, and frozen shoulder. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, will visiting a chiropractor help a frozen shoulder? Um, it might do. Um, I'm not prescribing, you know, at the end of the day, if something, as I say to a lot of my patients, look, if it works for you and it does, isn't going to do any harm, there may not be evidence for it, but it's you can try whatever you really wish if you think I don't there's no evidence to support that that chiropractor that, that would help at all with a frozen shoulder but some people listen you'd be surprised you know what what works for people so I wouldn't be that prescriptive very good <laughs> um and what would you say are the best pain medications to use I think start off with you know simple 
uh, paracetamol, non-steroidals to start with. If you then have to, some people do require morphine or codeine based tablets just in that very early phase because they are so painful. Uh, and I think if you're getting to the stage that you're thinking that you need a codeine based, you're probably best to put that corticosteroid injection into the joint because that probably will have uh, that will have a much greater effect. So um, those are the sort of basics I start off with. And I sometimes go to codeine or even tramadol occasionally, but not. I think once you're getting to that stage, the corticosteroid injection really can help. Excellent. Um, so uh, how long does this frozen shoulder thing last? It's been four months with no progress. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, the, the literature would say anywhere from a year to two years to fully resolve. And some people like to put time frames on the sort of initial uh, freezing bit, thawing. But I, I think it's, you know, I tend to tell most patients that if you do nothing, uh, you know, the sort of two year time point is where it, it'll probably burn itself out. Um, four months is is the pain, you know, the, the painful phase and you're starting to stiffen. So you've probably got another few months until the pain starts to go away. Again, we can accept, remember, we can accelerate those phases. They're not cast in stone. We can accelerate them with uh, pain relief, physiotherapy, corticosteroid injection, uh, hydrodilatate, etc. So we can intervene in those earlier phases if you're not progressing um, to sort of get you over the um, get you over that phase. So you might have already answered this one. Which kind of steroid injection is best? And I've suggested dexa, dexamethasone, uh, prednisolone, etc. There's no, there's anything, anything <laughs> at all that you can get into the joint. Um, it doesn't matter if it's Kenalog or Debbie. It doesn't really. There's no difference in the, in it. There's been no trials to show that different corticosteroid. Well, it makes a difference. It's really to do with just getting that corticosteroid into the glenohumeral joint. And if you're not confident injecting the glenohumeral joint blind, you should have it done under ultrasound guidance so that you can, you know, you get into the joint. One of the biggest problems sometimes is that they can be administered by people who don't regularly do um, joint shoulder joint injections, which can be tricky. And so they maybe have had an injection, but they've had it into the subcromial bursa, they've had it somewhere else that, and they don't see a benefit. So sometimes in those cases, I, I would say that a image guided uh, guided injection, usually ultrasound, is probably best. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, so, what would you expect after MUA and scope to clean up the inside, and what recovery time? Um, you're you, when well, you're in a sling for about twenty four hours, we get you moving straight away, and then it's really a case of just seeing the physio immediately. Uh, after this uh, in, in the first few days and really starting a strong stretching and range of movement protocol and that you re we really ramp that up you know that's for the first four to six weeks we're really quite particular with that and then they continue with stretching etc so um, you see quite a rapid response and of course you will have pain post-surgery everybody does but it's a different type of pain and it's usually more controlled with simple analgesia post-surgery so I would say but overall from an, a capsular release you're looking at about a, you know a sort of three month overall recovery period uh, until you're getting you know good functionality back in your arm that sort of time frame is what to expect. Mm, okay um, are there exercises diet etc that can be done to keep a healthy shoulder healthy? I wish there was uh, I mean I think any <laughs> I mean to keep a healthy shoulder you should yeah you should be good general exercise and health will ultimately we know this in the musculoskeletal system through OA through other joint diseases the better general health you keep whether that is just walking 2,000 or 10,000 steps a day these sort of things help general musculoskeletal health they help with um, uh, muscles tendons and if you keep those good then your likelihood of you having um musculoskeletal problems including frozen shoulder are much reduced so good general health really nothing specific for the shoulder okay um if you don't do any physiotherapy or ROM exercises do you risk losing that range forever yeah i would say yeah if you don't engage with that with that process yeah you can i mean people can have persist as i said 40 percent of patients actually if you ask them do have persistent functional issues with their shoulder and the, and the main one is obviously range of movement that they, their pain goes away on the on the whole but yeah you can be left if you don't engage in that process with a stiff um 
poor functioning shoulder and that is you know that's hard uh, because with when you when you get to a stage your muscles will waste your tend you know, your rotator cuff will have poor muscle bulk and you won't so it, the sequelae will be that you will get a poor functioning upper limb on the whole I have heard success stories having a marina IED removed and recovering quickly from th frozen shoulder. Is this something you've heard of? Yeah, there's a few case reports about that, and certainly, you know, for females, it, it, there's a lot of the not the there is data out there to say you know it is linked to HRT and hormonal influences. So I have seen a couple of case reports about the marina. It's not specific. I think what you're talking about there is more that. The hormonal imbalance is driving certain aspects of that disease and therefore gaining better control of the the, the hormonal um, aspects is probably what maybe drive or, or will maybe improve things but that's general that's again that points back to more general metabolic health um, so yes i've heard of that but it's not specific for the marina coin Mm, OK, yeah, the role of female hormones in arthrofibrosis is quite an interesting area in itself, I think. Yes, yeah. Mm. Um, we discussed surgery and they said they did not do surgery for frozen shoulder. Um, why won't they offer me surgery? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I saw that question. I'm not really sure because <laughs> surgery is um, a good option at a certain point. It may be that patient wasn't at the right point for surgery. Maybe that was put the wrong way. But uh, there is always a, there is a, a role for surgery at a certain stage. Certainly, I don't agree with that it should be done aggressively and early because there's plenty of evidence to show physio and other things work. So why put the patient through a high risk? Well, through a risky event. Um, so you know, I would certainly be waiting until at least nine beyond nine months for most of my patients uh, before I'd even consider a surgery as long as they tried all the other treatments before as well. Well that is really fantastic I so much appreciate your time um, it's a very interesting area and um, yeah I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in this um, expert primer video. Good no I mean it's, it's thank you for having me I think it's important as I say that frozen shoulders give you know given uh, it has been under investigated I think um, and it just affects so many people so I think that more research into this area it, you know in fibrosis in general um, it is useful and I think you, what you'll see over the next number of years is that the immune system certainly you know has a, a, a massive role to play in this disease and, and, and certainly that therapies will be targeted towards that. I think involving rheumatologists is um, going to be a yeah. big one for the future. Yes, I think that's I'm trying to promote right. that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for having me.